Hi, and welcome to the one-year anniversary episode of the Let's K-12 Better podcast. This podcast is a project between me, Mom of All Capes, and my kids. Hi! In our podcast, we will cover a variety of subjects involving K-12 education and family life. We will talk about the ways that parents, kids, and educators can improve K-12 education and family life. We encourage you to join our conversation on social media using the hashtag Let's K-12 Better. Before we get started, please hit pause, hit the subscribe button, and follow this podcast. Now, let's jump into Season 2, Episode 11 of the Let's K-12 Better Podcast. A year ago, we launched the first episode of the Let's K-12 Better Podcast with the episode, Schooling Through an Apocalypse. In that episode, we discussed how each of us was experiencing the first couple weeks of the pandemic and how it was impacting our learning. A year later, as schools reopened... What changed? As the events of the world played out in front of us on our phones, this podcast evolved into a year-long journey and exploration into justice, civics, and also how we can connect more meaningfully with each other. We've grown as a family. We've grown in our continued analysis of justice. We've expanded our awareness that families need to speak out. Recently, we led the crazy PLN community in a Twitter chat on cultivating a justice mindset in kids. We linked the wakelet in the show notes. Please check it out. The chat was a culmination of the work we've pushed through and pursued over this past year. Mom spent this year evangelizing accessible strategies for anti-racism on panels with parent groups and online. She co-moderates an equity discussion on Clubhouse every Saturday at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Darby joined the panel, Youth Taking a Stand Against Racism, at the Anti-Racism Live Global event hosted by Peace One Day in association with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Naima sat down with Dr. Krishana Gray to discuss intersectional tech, black cyber feminism, and democratizing the digital space. And Sophia joined her school's anti-racism book club. We're going to dig deep into how and why it's critical to cultivate a justice mindset in kids. We hope that you use this opportunity to have a discussion alongside us with the young people in your life. Feel free to stop and start this episode uh, during our own conversation to have yours. All right. It feels great to be back. Uh, I feel like we haven't been at the kitchen table in a while. We've been we've been interviewing folks and asking experts what they think. Yeah, we've been doing interviews ourselves and stuff too, which has been really cool. Um, but when we started this podcast, uh, we started it with an episode on schooling through the apocalypse, right? Um, thinking back, yeah, I remember that too, right? Thinking back on this past year, like honestly, we started recording the in first the ep- in the closet underneath my clothes with just my smartphone. And now we're here at our kitchen table, all mic'd up. It's really been great. Um, we probably will upgrade our mics to hopefully to help with our peas that pop all the time. <laughs> Popping peas. <laughs> that peas that pop. Hey. So let's just jump into a couple questions just about our evolution, right? Um, you know, what's changed about this podcast and even this year? What has stayed the same for you? Maybe, you know, each person talk, go around and say, you know, what you're nervous about as far as this year ahead. So think about one whole calendar year to the next April. And what are you excited about? What are you nervous about? What are you excited about? Something I'm like nervous about is this isn't really about the podcast, but like, a lot of my friends are going back to the school, so, like, I'm worried for their health, but mm-hmm. I I, I think that the teacher will give them good care and, like, make sure that they're ha- healthy and happy. Mm. And also, 
I'm really excited for this year. It's not about the podcast, but I'm really excited to go into fifth grade. But I'm also really nervous to go into fifth grade because it feels like I've been in elementary school so long. Mm-hmm. And, like, it's going to be really scary to go to middle school. Mm, that's awesome. That's awesome. So these are real, real things, right, that you're thinking about and balancing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. Uh, what about you? What if we were to sit a whole calendar year from now in the future, right? What do you hope? What is your hope for this upcoming year? You got the fall. You're going back into school in the fall. You know, we got potentially playing sports maybe next spring. What about you? Um, I'm not looking forward to anything. <laughs> Why not? Because I don't like to look forward to things in the future. Why not? Because I like living in the moment. You like living in the moment. That's it. Yep. Okay. I might have hopes for tomorrow. I'll never have hopes for next year. Wow. I don't know if that's... That sounds cool. Yeah, it could be cool. It could be beautiful. That could be dope. It could be terrible. It could be terrifying. That might be even a terrifying. It Is that how you look at life? In your life? Yep. Because if I'm not here tomorrow... If I'm not here tomorrow... Then- and I didn't fulfill my goal for next year, then what? Yeah, but you, you should don't. still... Sorry. <laughs> you could acknowledge them, or you could just wait until next year. We'll talk offline. Okay, when we turned the mic off, you said that there were aspects of school that didn't make sense, which did not make you excited about returning to school, that you'd rather stay home. Let's talk about, let's talk about that. Like, what about school doesn't make sense? Because you know what? In essence, that connects with the first episode of the po- the podcast. So what about school doesn't make sense? Well, first, if we're talking about like coronavirus school, a lot of schools like my school, they have literally everything boarded up and it's like one way hallways. And literally it's like prison and it doesn't make sense for people to go back if we can't talk to each other and be with our friends because that's what school is for. Because actually school work, it's not really important. It's important for you to get good grades, but like in all essence, it's not important. Like the only, the school is like socializing. And there's a lot of people who want to go back to school because they're lonely, not because they need to. And they're just trying to do it as quick as they can because there's a lot of people complaining that their child's lonely. Mm. That I honestly, I think that that is a very, beautiful statement like I honestly think that's a beautiful statement right because we need to analyze right like is just being around other kids enough if you have to be three to six feet apart right like no it's not after coronavirus school is never going to be the same because there's going to be kids who are scared even after the vaccine who just like after coronavirus it's not going to be the same so school's not going to be the same Mm-hmm. So I'm not, it's not that I'm not looking forward to it or anything. I don't, I don't really like school and I don't, you know, but th- it's just not going to be the same as before. So, mm, so the ideas that people have in their mind about I'm going back to school as in going to see their friends every day, having birthday parties normally, like hugging each other. Like there's going to be like a lot of things like h- touching each other. is not going to be a lot. Hugging each other is not going to be a lot. Talking to each other is going to be minimal. Mm hmm. So our social norms are going to have to change. Yeah. Yeah, which makes school very different from what it was pre... Last year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate you for that. All right. So how about you? If we were to sit here and be able to fast forward into the future a year from now, tell me a bit about what you think, you know, you'll see or what you're worried about or what you're excited for. Um, well, I'm excited for being able to see people again, because even though I don't, well, not like I don't like people, I have like just a small group of friends and we just like to hang out Mm -hmm. and like COVID has kind of pushed some of us to like be like, we still contact each other. We still talk like we'll FaceTime or like text, but like we don't talk as much as we used to because, um, we used to hang out like a lot like together like Mm -hmm. you know 
Um, but I'm not looking forward to going back to school because even though the vaccine's coming out and starting to get safer, I feel like people aren't going to follow, like, the rules. Like, because I know that school isn't going to be, like, exactly how it was before, but it's going to be some, they're going to try to make it as similar as possible. And I don't think that, um, like, every kid's going to follow like the rules, the rules. Mm. like there are gonna be some kids who like say we have to keep wearing our masks um even if like coronavirus is not over like there are gonna be some kids who are trying to take off their mask during the school day because the mask you can't really breathe in it like stuff like that is what i'm worried about and what kind of bothers me mm. i appreciate that i appreciate that is there anything else um I'm not really excited for next year because of sports. Like, because I got kind of comfortable in my room. (laughs) I I just got comfortable in my room pretty much. Like, because I used to, like, not be in there a lot. And now I got settled in my room. We were on the move a lot. A lot again. Yeah, we were never home. It's like a solar eclipse, I guess. Once every every blue moon. (laughs) That's true. That's true. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right. So while we um, are recording, we find out that Derek Chauvin was found guilty um, of all three charges in the murder of George Floyd. Um, We talked about a lot about we've talked a lot about racism. We've talked a lot about um, police brutality. so what are you guys we we i'll say this we did not watch the trial um just because i personally could not um get through it i saw a few clips of it but that was pretty much it yeah yeah i'll probably see if if we can go back and watch it later and talk about it as a family um but there are moments where it's okay if you're feeling sad right overwhelmed overwhelmed sad um, that you don't have to subject yourself to to that. Um, so, what are you guys? What are your initial reactions to the verdict? Um. So my initial reaction is I'm I'm glad that they found who was actually guilty and that he got the charges mm-hmm. and that he didn't just get get to get away with it because what he did like wasn't really fair and like to the community and like it was really sad for like George Ford's family and mm-hmm. like a lot of people were feeling sad about it and I'm so happy that like they found justice. Mm. I appreciate that. Anyone else want to share their reaction? I felt like first of all um good on like good on the uh the like the jury. Yeah, because uh, I'm not saying that he sh- like he couldn't have been found innocent, but there was literally video evidence of this man pretty much killing someone. Not pretty much. Lynching. Um, yeah, lynching someone and like getting away with it because he's a cop, and them putting out the guilty verdict is um kind of like I I don't want to say. It's well, like yeah like a step forward because mm-hmm. um it's not like in most cases like this the person just runs off free it's they don't get caught even if there is video evidence even if there is so much evidence to like um support that they did the thing there's they get off free um but this was kind of like a two steps forward mm, i appreciate that analysis in response. Thank you. You know, I do want to say that it's probably very hard to be a juror in any case, um, but especially a high profile case like this one. It's very hard to be a juror. Yes. Mm-hmm. We want to have empathy for the for those people who were who were um, on the jury. How about you? Um, I'm not surprised that he was found guilty. Um, I also like. Because I kind of was just like, if he's not found guilty, there's something wrong with these people. Because, like Naima said, there's video evidence. So, like, I'm not really surprised he's found guilty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I just wanted to briefly interrupt the um, interview to say just a few candid thoughts. Um, after we completed recording, we found out um, later that evening, my daughter pulled up um, her phone and said, Mom, someone else was murdered by police. Um, she's in Ohio and she's only 16. And I couldn't believe it. And I thought it was, you know, late that evening, but it had happened, you know, right around the verdict, um, the Derek Chauvin verdict. So, you know, I pulled up Twitter and I began to scroll through and I was overwhelmed with emotion um, and exhaustion, right? Here we are in this moment where, you know, as a family, we're beginning to talk about the Derek Chauvin case, um, beginning to resolve our own emotions around George Floyd's murder. Um, and unfortunately, um, another young woman loses her life uh, that same day. Um, and again, not to erase the other folks who've died um, due to police violence last week or the week before that or the week before that or the week before that. But I do want to say her name, Makia Bryant. Um, I do want to say that um, I also want to acknowledge uh, because we forgot to do this and I don't want to forget anyone, but we forgot to acknowledge 17 year old Darnella Frazier, who stood as a witness and videotaped George Floyd's murder for all of us to see. She stood there for those nine minutes, even, uh, you know, as her own life was threatened, um, even as her own mental health and wellness, um, you know, were put um, at stake. So like, you know, we need to think about, right, um, what are the ways in which teenagers even, you know, young people are standing for justice? What are the ways in which um, violence and racism and, you know, systematic racism impact the lives of our black and brown and indigenous and people of color and other people with marginalized identities? What are the ways in which these things impact our youth? And as parents and educators, we need to begin to think about how is this impacting the young people in my life? If I'm, whether I'm raising a BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, person of color youth, uh, a youth with a marginalized identity, or a white youth, I still need to think about how these things are impacting them. I still have a responsibility as a parent, an educator, or a mentor um, to provide space for these young people to process what they're seeing. Again, my daughter showed me uh, what happened on, on her smartphone. She saw it before I did, right? I was thinking George Floyd's murder has been, you know, for whatever, you know, we've, we've got justice. I'm going to go to sleep tonight. Um, I did not sleep last night. So just want to hold up those two young women in the light, especially because I'm, you know, approaching having black teens uh, in the United States. Just want to think about that. want to process that. I also want to add, you know, we talked a little bit um, just previously about um, school and schooling through an apocalypse. I do want to draw everyone's attention to the NPR coverage of Josh and his mother, Sharnessa Secret. Um, the title of it is, For Some Black Students, Remote Learning Has Offered a Chance to Thrive. Um, I will say that we are that family. We've thrived during remote learning. We've had our ups and downs. We've had our bumps here. I think it's more, you know, understanding how to use the technology and having motivation. Um, but just thinking about, you know, the push to go back to school, a lot of families were saying, we got to get black and brown kids learning loss, like get them in schools. When a lot of black and brown families were like, we're fine. <laughs> we're doing great at home. Right. So thinking about, you know, what and some are not right. Everyone's not doing great at home, but everyone is also not super excited to return to school. And so we have to think about that and we have to respect that. We have to investigate, you know, why are some black and brown kids thriving more during remote learning when they're not in the classroom environment? Right. Why are some students with ADHD or other neurodiversities thriving when they're not in the classroom and others are not, 
right? So we need to think about individual cases and understand that everyone's different. Um, but we also need to respect the fact that um, what narratives are we going to tell? What narratives are we going to lift up? My daughter once said to me, you know, it's not necessarily the teachers or the curriculum or the school completely. It's my peers. Some of my peers are intolerant, right? Um, so I think about that. And it's like, well, what responsibility do families have to make sure that when they send their kid to school, they're sending someone to this environment who is excited to be a part of a community, um, to respect the differences of other people, um, to uplift others, right? And to explore with other people. Um, as we all move forward, you know, out of, hopefully out of COVID-19, and we move toward a more, what we would call a normalized experience, how do we leverage what we found, this opportunity that we were in a mini lab experiment? What are our equity um, tenants for our school system or our school or our home? What have we learned about our kids spending all this time with our children in our homes? What have we learned about our kids? What have you taken the time to learn about your kids during this time? Have you gotten to know them better um, now that they've spent this time with you um, lots of time with you at home or have you been so excited to get them back to school that you didn't take the time to get to know them and, and get to learn who they are right so just thinking about you know what are we going to make space for and what are we going to eliminate um what are the things that we think are unnecessary how do we open our imagination so that more people enjoy the schooling environment um, and enjoy learning more and then one more time as we think about justice, we really want to think about, you know, our young people with marginalized identities, specifically, you know, I want to hold up black and brown girls, specifically black girls right now, because I'm raising three. Um, just thinking about like, what kind of environments are conducive for their thriving and their success? How do I collaborate with educators and other parents um, to ensure that that happens? All right, so we're going to segue into how we cultivate a justice mindset because, again, a lot of people are focused on justice right now. Um, we did have that crazy PLN Twitter chat, which was super awesome. Again, dope, yes. Uh, we linked the um, experience on the Wakelet in the show notes, so check that out. We talk a lot about justice on our podcast. Um, so you know, let's redefine for folks, like what is a justice mindset and what are the benefits of cultivating a justice mindset? So what I said was basically a justice mindset is like um, someone who has a mind, well, not someone, but a mindset that is striving to um, make the society and their communities more equitable and more equal. Mm, I love that. And, you know, like, well, then what are the benefits of that? What would the benefits of that be? And I said that some of the benefits would be like um, being able to be more focused and more driven on like these topics like um, justice and equity and inequalities. Mm. Can you apply justice to anything? Um, you can apply justice to a lot of issues that people are um, focusing on like today. Um, you can apply justice to even the simplest thing like someone stole your purse because you if someone is stealing your purse or taking your money whatever you're experiencing an injustice that injustice being your purse was stolen and you can speak out about that and you can take action to prevent that mm, okay um what are some other areas not just like the criminal justice system, right? Because I think a lot of people focus on justice and they think about criminal justice. What are some other areas? Some other areas are racial justice, mm -hmm. social justice. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to say community justice. But yes, like, community yeah, justice. Yes, community justice. Um, also, equity justice. I think that's Well, justice and equity yeah. kind of w hold hands. You know, the equity, mm -hmm. justice, hopefully creates some form of equity within the human condition right so hopefully if there's justice then we can begin to experience equity right mm -hmm. um 
and if there's equity then justice has been served hopefully hopefully it's not it's not it's not guaranteed it's not, guaranteed. It's not mutually exclusive what about the environment um yeah can you have environmental justice yeah how it's about actually, gender yes yeah how about tech yeah. Oh my God! So I I had an episode about tech and justice. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Shout um, out to Dr. Kashana Gray. She's amazing. <laughs> yes. But yeah, you can find justice. Like mm-hmm. you can find inequities and inequality in pretty much everything. Um, and you can take action to making that um place better. Thank you so much. So I think a justice mindset is when you think about how certain actions and events affect people and communities and how you can make sure that you fight for their justice when inequities happen. Mm. You're also responsible for like things that your community needs and you also advocate for that thing. So you're thinking like in a interconnected way. I really like that a lot. Yeah. Right. So like, can I just ask like, would this be true if my justice depends on your justice? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and what are the benefits then of, if you're thinking, yeah, interdependency in your justice then, right? Like then what are the benefits of cultivating a justice mindset? If you're thinking of it as my justice is connected to your justice. Um, you'll be able to have the skills to look out for things that are in just like, that have injustices and you'll also be able to also not only fight for like your community's justice but like other people around your community mm, so you that's I appreciate that I don't have anything else to say because you kind of took the words yeah you killed it yeah exactly alright so we're gonna move into our next question um And I want to ask you guys, what have you learned about justice from talking about it on this podcast? Um, As a family, we went on, you know, an exploration through literature and reading. Um, We've read essays and we've read books like, you know, we've read James Baldwin. We've read Audre Lorde. We've read Chimamanda Adichie. I mean, we've gone into all of these really amazing spaces. Um, We also did some documentary and movie watching as well right Mm -hmm. so what have you learned about justice after this year-long exploration into what it is i've learned about justice that a lot of people don't get justice like Mm -hmm. and some people they're accused of injustice when they haven't done it like a lot of, like some people they go to jail even though it's proven that they didn't do it Mm. or like they like Naima said earlier, like she said, like about injustice can be a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And I've also learned that justice, like it can be really beautiful, because like it, like it, like helps people grow and like helps people evolve mm. into the new world. You slayed it. Thank you. You're welcome. How about you? What have you learned in our year-long family joint adventure uh, in learning about justice? I learned that justice, it comes in many forms. Like, um, like we don't think, sometimes when we think of justice, we're thinking of, like, oh, marching in the streets, um, or, like, just, like, making it, like, really loud and, like, yeah, that's a good thing. Like, we want our awareness to be spread we want people to know about these things but we can also do things like writing letters Mm -hmm. writing books um we can even just inform ourselves on these topics and these things Mm. so it's not just about like protesting that's not the only avenue to bringing justice right there's writing letters and being an active civic participant in that way Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to your elected officials the governor. Mm-hmm. Also, policy justice, right? How do we write policies to ensure that people are experiencing a just and fair and equitable experience in their communities in this country, right? So I just love, thank you that you brought those ideas to this discussion. All right, so 
Like we have like two questions left. Oh no. All right. So <laughs> <laughs> let's get serious. I like serious. I do too. All right. Mm. Anyway, <laughs> so shut up, stop. Cut stop. the cameras. Cut the cameras. <laughs> no. We're not gonna cut the cameras. Um this question is for you. When is it appropriate to start cultivating a justice mindset in kids? Why also? It's appropriate, like, when they go to, like, school or, like, child care. And if you're, like, homeschooling them, it's, impor- it's important, like, when they're, like, five or, like, four. Um, because they need to, like, be able to identify if something goes wrong or if they're being bullied at school. And they need to identify if they're getting the correct, like, Answer. not stop, stop. The correct, like, solution. Like, if someone's, like, bullying you and pulling your hair at school and you tell the teacher, like, the teacher's not supposed to just say, oh, well, that's okay. Like, no, like, they're supposed to, like, tell the principal or tell your parents, like, put up a meeting, you know what I'm saying? Like, they need to identify what was fair for them. So you're talking about this as helping young people to identify the process for receiving justice. So when you say telling the teacher, there should be some sort of action that comes after that that kids should expect. Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure I synthesize this correctly. Um, Okay, love it, love it. So your sister said that prior to getting into school, all right, or around four or five, is when we can start to begin to cultivate a justice mindset in kids. What about you? What do you think? Well, I think it's appropriate, like, I agree with Garvey, like, when they start school. But, like, mostly at the end of kindergarten or the beginning of first grade. Because at in kindergarten, it's mostly about looking around and seeing what's new mm. in the world and, like, learning things. Well, around, like, first grade, I think that they know enough about the world at their age, mm-hmm. like that that they're supposed to know at their age, to like learn about it and like think about it and actually deeply think in it, or also at the end of first grade and beginning of second grade. So you're saying that parents and educators essentially need to trust young people, especially our elementary age kids, because they can... They can process this information. It's not too scary. How would you tell an elementary kid about justice? I think Do you have that, an example? Like, an example might be, like, telling them. So, like, having, like, a one-on-one discussion about it. Like, not just saying it to them straight. Like, break it up into parts, like, so this is what happens. This is what you need to do when someone's getting bullied or you're getting bullied. Like you need to tell the teacher about this instead of just saying, "Okay, you need to tell the teacher about this," and then blah blah blah, and then blah blah blah, and then blah blah blah, because they won't have time to process it. Oh, so you yeah. should break up lessons about justice into bite-sized pieces. Yes. Um. You also need to add why, because a lot of kids like they'd be like, "Okay, but." there's nothing for me in it like there's always if there's justice like there's something for you in it if you win but like they don't know that yet so you have to tell them like what the reward is which is you know they get in trouble or they don't get like you have to tell them because i think they'll be like well i mean i could tell the teacher but like i'm not going to get anything out of it so Mm. so you want to make sure that as you're teaching about justice you're connecting the purpose of it to the individual's I don't want to say selfishness but like their own desire for like self actualization. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I would I want to also add with elementary age kids since you guys have brought this up that you don't have to jump hardcore into like this is how justice is not shown up in the world for different races of people. You don't have to go that deep. Lessons on justice are often just social emotional learning. So that young, the youngest of us can learn about how do we look out for each other? How do we ensure our communities are safe and fair and equitable? Actually, today in school, like, it's so weird because we learned about the same thing in school, like, what you should do. And, like, it's so cool because, like, 
we talked about this exact thing, like about social emotional learning. We talked about a whole bunch of things, and I think that we're also covering the topics in this podcast. Yo, see, shout out to best practices in school. That's Neat. awesome. Um, and I will say, shout out to being at home and making the connections from school to home and from home to school. It's one big learning experience. Okay. Okay, so your sisters gave um, us some ideas about when to start, but it's not necessarily intuitive and easy, right? So if parents don't know where to start, what would you tell them about creating environments that cultivate a justice mindset in kids? What advice do you have? Um, I would tell parents that um, when you cultivate justice mindsets in kids, like first off, before you do anything, you need to make sure that the environment is an environment where these kids are actively wanting to like learn and cultivate these mindsets um, and that it continues to be that kind of setting and that kind of place because so you you're saying that you want parents to create homes where learning is an ongoing experience yes okay. because um when learning stops being fun people are gonna stop wanting to learn and that's gonna start a like a drop down or like a drop off like this disconnect i guess um, where it's like, w this was fun until last week when it stopped being fun. Mm -hmm. We don't want to learn this anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Let's keep it a hundred. Um, what like, other, what other elements in the environment, um, help to cultivate this justice mindset, whether it's little kids or big kids or middle aged kids. Um, and it's not just one thing I wanted to point out specifically was it's not just cultivating justice mindsets it's making sure it's continuous cultivation instead of oh i cultivated his mindset he's he's off in the world now it's you've got to continually check in with your kid and help cultivate a justice mindset in your child so that they're not like oh it was a one and done thing Mm, so it's not just one conversation. This is continuous. a continuous process of growth and development throughout the entirety of your child's life. Hold yeah. on one second. One Don't second. Hold on. Cry. Yes, you are next. You're next. No, okay, next. I just want to make sure your sister doesn't have anything left over. Anything else you want to talk about? One more thing. Um, no. Okay, see, way to yield your time to these guys. All right, hold on one second. I wanted to add that since the world is changing and like the definition of justice is changing as the world is changing, um, like we need to also like, like Naima said, like keep them learning because like we don't want to say justice means they got in trouble, right? Because getting in trouble isn't like, it doesn't matter if they got in trouble or not. It matters if you were like justified in that situation which in some cases yes like in like three out of ten cases it means them getting in trouble but the other seven is like different so i love how you're make equating the fact that justice is not always punishment yes okay all right i, I really do appreciate you bringing that point in here so as we cultivate a justice mindset, it's not always about consequences or getting in trouble. It's more about how do my behaviors, again, create an environment where everyone um, can self-actualize. Yeah, it can feel good. Okay, I love that. Thank you. All right, so as we think about cultivating a justice mindset in kids, whether it's at home or whether it's at school, right, um, how about you? What are your suggestions for the kind of environment? Mostly, like, for school. Mm -hmm. um, you need the, t like, it's not, you need, like, you need to make sure that, like, in school you're, like, participating and, like, but also you need the teacher to be, like, talking to stuff about you. You can't just have the teacher pull out a worksheet about justice and then just have it done. She needs to actually teach a lesson about it. She's going to put a worksheet out. She's going to, or they, 
they're going to have to, like, put it out and, like, say, okay, so here's what you have to do. Here's the situation. Mm, so when you cultivate a justice mindset, it is a participatory experience. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Right? So the, the students or the young people want to participate and also your teacher needs to participate. Right. And creates an environment where people are engaged. I and mean, they like to be engaged. Yeah. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Wow. A year ago, we were in the my closet. closet. <laughs> <laughs> Under a bunch of clothes. Under a bunch of coats. Oh my goodness. Yeah, like sis, what? Um It's been it's so weird how we've evolved. We have evolved. What Exposing a difference. Exposing our makes. closet. Yeah, set up. right. With my with with my iPhone and uh now here we are mic'd up. I just want to thank you guys so much for being here with me, going on this journey with me. It has been an absolute pleasure being here in discussion with you guys this entire year. Um, as we explored important topics, I want to remind everyone who's listening to please subscribe. Please, please it's subscribe. Hard to, um, Hit that subscribe button. Hashtag shameless self promotion. Hashtag shameless self promotion. Um, and I also want to say, on a more serious note, that we want to hold up George Floyd's family in the light right now, right? Um, because although um, you know Derek Chauvin was convicted, Guilty. right? Still, they want to feel really sad but i hope that they have got justice and that even though he's not with them that they still like are so happy that he was proven justice yeah that they received some justice for that it's not going to bring their their family member back their son their brother their father their friend it's not going to bring him back but hopefully it's going to raise the spirits this helps just a little bit all right. Yes. Hi. Thank you, guys. You're amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. It's coming back to recess. One year anniversary. It's our one year anniversary. It's your one year anniversary. One year anniversary. Go, girl. One year anniversary. One year anniversary. One year anniversary. Yeah. What are the young people in your life passionate about and how can you encourage them to look at their interests with justice or equity lens? We challenge families and educators to think more about how we empower young people right now and later rather than preparing them for leadership later in life. We need kids equipped with the skills to be able to talk to people who are different from them. There are a lot of civic, social, environmental, educational, economic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, issues that need to be addressed. And young people have the excitement and the passion to engage these issues. It's just up to the adults to get out of the way and to connect them with the levers of power so that they build the confidence and the skills to solve these problems. Societal problems aren't going away if you ignore them, pretend they don't exist, or shield your kids from the disappointment that you think they'll experience if we understand these issues deeply. We believe that families of all types must talk about race, justice, equity, civic participation, and so many other important topics deemed controversial. Parents should never serve as a barrier to educators who are trained to hold challenging discussions in classrooms. Instead, Educate yourself alongside your child. Our world is evolving, and you're not protecting your child or your way of life by denying your kids these opportunities to learn more. In fact, you're hindering their chances to contribute meaningfully by doing so. If you have any cool epiphanies you'd like to share, leave them in the comments or share them with us on social media. Each episode, we will share quotes that we find inspirational. 
Marva Collins was an educator best known for founding the West Side Preparatory School, a low-cost private school specifically for the purpose of teaching low-income Black children that Collins felt the Chicago public school system had labeled as being learning disabled. Her quotes. Trust yourself. Think for yourself. Act for yourself. Speak for yourself. Be yourself. Imitation is suicide. When someone is taught the joy of learning, it becomes a lifelong process that never stops, a process that creates a logical individual. That is the challenge and joy of teaching. Excellence is not an act, but a habit. The things you do most are the things you will do best. Don't try to fix the students. Fix ourselves first. The good teacher makes the poor student good and the good student superior. When our students fail, we as teachers and parents, too, have failed. Thank you for listening to the Let's K-12 Better podcast. Please like, subscribe, and share. We are so thankful to all of our listeners and subscribers for coming back each week to learn with us at the kitchen table. Thank you so much for this really amazing year. We, of course, want to hear from you. So connect with us on social media at Let's K-12 Better on all social media platforms or connect with me on Twitter and Instagram at Mom of All Capes. The Let's K-12 Better podcast is available on every podcasting platform. So if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review our podcast. Your feedback helps us grow. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time.